running joke now is like, yeah, we work together, but um, he's got a, he's got like eight steps separating me and his office. So okay, cool. <laughs> well, awesome. Well, I think we can probably get you know started. We have a few folks that have joined us, and and again, we'll be able to have this conversation for for sharing out. Um, this is just our, our third or fourth of our 8830 leadership chats and really honored to have uh, Jeremy and Mallory with us today. Um, these are conversations we've been having around with the backdrop of the 8830, um, but really thinking about part of the next generation, you know, new ideas, current events, innovation. Um, and we have some great partners. We have NICPAD, Lakeshore, Disability and Sport, and also um, NAFAPA, which is the North American Federation of Adaptive Physical Activity, and also the International Federation. Um, so we have a, a lot of really good groups that have come together to engage these conversations. Um, and today, I know we're going to turn it over to uh, Jeremy and Mallory to, to share out for a bit, about 15, uh, 10 to 15 minutes, kind of some key points some highlights, some best practices, some, some thoughts where they're at. Um, and then we're going to engage a conversation. Um, before we turn it over to uh, to Jeremy and Mallory, I'm going to hand it over to Bob uh, Bob Lujano with Nick Pad and Lakeshore for a few opening remarks as well. So over to you, Bob. Uh, oh, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, thank you, Eli. I just want to welcome uh, Jeremy and, and Mallory, and uh, as well as our uh, audience that's uh, that's joining us and. You know, uh, when we started these talks, you know, the objective was really to tap into uh, disability leaders, and, and we definitely uh, have some right here. Um, it, it's always good to have, uh, you know, Paralympians and CEOs, uh, you know, being our, our, our leaders as we look into the future, and just coming up with uh, innovative ideas uh, as we move forward, uh, celebration of ADA 30 and even beyond, uh, and definitely looking for that leadership to, uh, to give us the vision and direction uh, to conserve our community as our growing community and just being realized that we do have a voice uh, in this world, in this country, uh, and it definitely needs to start from us, uh, people with disabilities and, and people in leadership positions. So welcome, Jeremy Mallory, and uh, definitely appreciate uh, you giving us uh, this time today. Thank you, Eli. Oh. Awesome. Well, we'll hand it over to you, uh, Mallory, Jeremy, and yeah, we'd love for you just to share out um, if you wanted to, you know, share your screen or whatnot, but if not, feel free just to kind of, you know, start the conversation with us, um, and then Bob and I will follow up, and we also have a great audience that's coming in, and so really just an informal, you know, the, these leadership, leadership chats are intended to be informal, uh, but also to be kind of thought leadership, and uh, so we'll turn it over to both of you now. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Eli and Bob, for having us. This is a, a great opportunity for us to be able to share just our, our passion with you guys. And I, I love that concept of, you know, really just starting that conversation. And I think that's so important, especially within the disability community, to spark a conversation and, and start somewhere. So to all of you guys who are joining today, um, thanks for being here as well. So a little high level, just background on myself. Um, I am a two-time Paralympian for Team USA, currently training for the Tokyo Games, which will now be in 2021. And I incurred my injury later in life. So I was new to the disability community in 2008. And I'm in that bucket where I, I still, all these years later, hate to admit, but I think it's an important part of it where for almost 19 years of my life, I was pretty much wholly unaware of the disability community at large. I, well, I grew up with a father who was partially deaf and I knew individuals in my life. I, I don't think I really understood the intricacies of the disability community, of disability rights, of adaptive sport, like that was all foreign to me. And so when I was injured in 2008, I was, I was paralyzed due to a medical procedure. There were some complications that left me as a T10 complete spinal cord injury. And it felt like that whole world was new. I, I didn't know the basics of how I was going to move about the world. But I also, bigger than that, I really struggled with this idea of seeing a path forward because I mean, we're in 2020 and we talk about the need for greater representation. And obviously I know in 2008, I was beyond 
privileged to have opportunities I didn't even realize I had because of the work that so many generations prior to me in the disability space had fought for, but there wasn't a lot of representation. And I didn't really see within my own community a path forward for what life was to be. And I think a lot of us can relate to that sentiment. And for me, my exposure to it truly came by chance. I was three weeks out of the hospital. I was at home on a Saturday morning reading our local newspaper in Minneapolis. And my sister saw an article about the 2008 Beijing trials for swimming. And they were being hosted at the University of Minnesota. And for my family and I, as we sat in Egan, Minnesota, around my parents' kitchen table, that was the first moment we heard about the Paralympic movement. And we went online and Googled it and looked it up. And I, newly paralyzed, fought against the notion that we were going to go to the pool that night and watch. I was like, no, 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 no. It's snowing in Minnesota in April. I'm still new to this. Like, I'm staying home. And we ended up going because I have a very loving, supportive, pushing family. And we showed up at the pool that night and my world was completely opened. But what I found in the 12 years since is that exposure point for me was by chance. And that's not an uncommon story for so many in the disability <laughs> community, whether it be sport, whether it be a professional ambition that they have. Finding a path forward isn't the norm. And once you find it, it's typically by luck. And so I've really focused on that aspect in my career as an athlete, but then also in my career outside of the pool as a member of the advisory board of disability for Delta Airlines, as a speaker, as a writer, as now a co-founder and co-CEO of TFA Group, to really focus on how do we remove luck from the equation? How do we create it so that individuals, regardless of their age, regardless of their perceived ability, have equal access to society at large? And that's really become, I think, a big passion for the both of us. And, you know, when we started talking about TFA Group, while we've only formally been in business for a few years, we've been talking about the concept of it for quite a while. I mean, in 2010, just a few years after my injury, I, I rented a camera and partnered up with Swimming World and filmed interviews of my teammates at the OTC at our meet honoring Jimmy Flowers, our coach who had passed away, and submitted it all to them. And then in 2014, when I had an injury, Jay and I were like, well, what can we do since you're not competing internationally? And we went and we went to one of our corporate sponsors we know, and we went to a swim outlet we knew who is like a media outlet within the swimming world called swim swam and we decided we were going to give coverage to the 2014 pan pack championships for which were in pasadena california and frankly wouldn't have otherwise had any coverage for individuals in the u.s trying to tune in and so we really found these moments that exposed us to that passion and then ultimately in recent years kind of brought that passion together and and formed TFA Group on that, that idea that we wanted to do our part through our respective crafts to make it so our next generation doesn't have to ask, what about me? So we can, through the work we do in our corner of the world, know that we've done our part through our career to pave a path forward so other people can remove luck and chance from it and have those opportunities available to them and at least have the knowledge to know what they are. Well, I think you said everything. <laughs> <laughs> so I've had a, a different path, you know, into the, the Paralympic and, and disability community. I did grow up with uh, several family members and friends uh, with disabilities. So I was exposed at an early age uh, to the disability world. And through life, you know, for me, sports, with, sports and community service uh, were always a passion. And um, growing up playing sports and ended up going to Syracuse, played football at Syracuse. And you know, wanted to move into the sports world and figure out how do I combine my business degree, finance and marketing with, with sports? And how do I find that passion? And it took some time, as, as we all know, you kind of go through life and I started in finance, started private equity and realized quickly, I wasn't going to be able to have the impact and the social impact that I wanted to have uh, through that work. So I quickly pivoted and 
and found my way back into the sports world and, and mainly on the, uh, the athlete representation side. And I've had some great mentors over the years. And one of them was through uh, some early work at Legacy, which was founded by uh, Mark Rockefeller and the Rockefeller family, and really helping develop legacies for athletes. And what does that look like, not just from the brand endorsements, but from the whole aspect of an athlete. So the philanthropic side, uh, giving back side, what does that look like? And through the years, took a lot of that learning and figured out, okay, this is where I can have the impact. You know, I can do something more here and work with these athletes. And uh, kind of my pivotal moment for me was in 2011, Eli, at the uh, the ESPYs. And uh, there was an award given out to best female athlete with a disability, and it happened to be my now wife. And it was my exposure point to the Paralympic movement at that point. And from 2011 to now, it's been pretty amazing to see this, this transformation. And for me, as a kind of like I like to call, you know, a social impact entrepreneur, looking at opportunities that we can have an impact through our work. And that exposure to the Paralympics in 2011 was my aha moment to say, we need to do more. We need to do more in marketing. We need to do more in media. We need to figure this out and combine our relationships, you know, from the creative side to the uh, corporate executive side, to the marketing side, agencies. And how do we move this path in a forward momentum? And Mallory and I would have constant talk even before we dated of like, what, what's the impact and legacy that we want to have? And we quickly found out that our values and our mission aligned so well that, you know, we ended up getting married four years ago now and formed our business and kind of, you know, really honed in on what is the impact that we want to have through our business and through our life. And it's become a true lifestyle business for us. And it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing. Uh, it's all inspiring to see how far we've come since 2011 to where we are in 2020 and where we want to go. And uh, looking, looking back now, it's, uh, you know, that aha moments 2011. And for me, the driving force, we live it every day, is how do we change that perception of disability in our society? What can we do with our work to help that, to be solution oriented? And I think that's where we connect so well is we're very solution oriented. We talk about innovations, we're constantly having to innovate and in how do we get the word out there about disability representation in media and how do we do that and a lot of it's through our work and we've had to create it ourselves. like mallory said in 2014 there was a void there was no coverage of the pair of pan packs so what do we do well we have some relationships on the corporate side we have some relationships on media we have creative relationships you know and and kind of combined all those relationships into one team and said here's our vision here's the impact we want to have how can we achieve it so it's a win across the board for everybody? And that, I think, we came back after looking at everything we were able to do and the coverage and the videos, the editorial, said, okay, we're on to something. There's something here. This is just a start. And little by little, we just started continuing to build uh, our relationships across, what I said, like kind of the three sectors from the creative world uh, the, uh, the marketing world and then the media distribution world and figuring out how do we kind of keep building momentum there. And I think with that, one of the things we've really had to do, you know, you talk about innovation and solution oriented and all that stuff. We are in a new landscape. I mean, yes, there is, there are other people out there doing this, but the, unfortunately the concept of seeing representation in the disability for the disability community in media isn't 100 percent proven and we still hit roadblocks you get no's because corporations feel like if it's something that's a, a media driven property and disabilities included in it then they need to have a special budget for that or a special disability strategy versus just realizing that's just part of the overall marketing budget at large and so you do hit those roadblocks and i think what we've really enjoyed is instead of seeing those roadblocks as no's, learning insight from them and insight from, okay, so where are the challenges? What is it that we're up against? And then how can we kind of back out, create universality in the approach and come back in through a new lens? And we've done that kind of over and over through that pivoting and finding ways, you know, to honestly create our own proof points. I mean, one of our 
biggest projects, which I'll let Jay talk about, that we start our first biggest project was Empty Net. And it's a documentary on Team USA's sled hockey team. And, and Jay and I pulled our resources together and our relationships, and we brought a team out to Pyeongchang. And when we went, we went with one idea. And when we came out, based on the stories that unfolded, we ended up with this entirely different project in front of us that frankly didn't have a budget but we said this story needs to be told and we have the media relationships to make sure that the story is seen and we created our own proof point and we came together with our resources and said we believe in this story and we're gonna do it we're gonna start this somewhere and you know that's not sustainable for the long haul and i do truly believe that we are getting traction in the community, but it is about creating those proof points and mm -hmm. those concepts and like really seeing, okay, where's, where's the solution. And some of that that's been really enjoyable for us has been, it's not just educating the corporate relationships and marketers that we work with and the agencies, but it's also been educating our talent pool of creatives that we work with. And it's been so fun to watch Jay, especially, He's done such a phenomenal job with this on projects and I've gotten to come in and kind of, it's almost sensitivity training, if you will, as a, a woman in a wheelchair with a disability, kind of stopping our, our creatives and saying, hey, hang on, I know that instinctually this feels like the right shot, but remember, we wanna focus on person first, disability second. And we wanna get that tight up of their, their facial expressions in that moment as they're saying this before we shoot to that tight shot of them wheeling their chair or whatever it is. And so just kind of reframing how people put, have put stories together in the editing room or how our DPs film during projects. And that has been really enjoyable for the both of us because we've both been able to bring our perspective and expertise to that table. And I think, one other thing, because I want Jay to share a few of the projects we, we've gotten to work on, but one of the other things that early on we really decided as kind of like our motivator when we sat at our kitchen table, which is like our little war room at home, is there will be no's. There will be people that don't get it, and we're going to hit doors that feel like they're shut. And we have to figure out how do we stay motivated through that. And I think a lot of it has been we've realized that as a business, impact is currency. And so as a business, we need to step back and say, okay, yeah, you need to make business sense of every project you do. But for us, there, these stories have such great impact and an impact on what's going to happen in our society in a year, in five years, in 10 years within the disability space and representation. We need to look at that impact as part of the currency, if you will, for a project and its driving force. And so we've really done that and found ways to make sure that we're not creating content that's just this feel good inspiration, but this empowerment and leading people to action because it's so important of how do you craft a story, especially in the disability community. And I, I live it every day. We live it together. Yeah. And I know so many of you guys live it. And it is one of those things where you just want to be an equal. We're not sitting here saying we need special stories told about us or all this stuff. It's quite literally people with disabilities are doing incredible things and are a part of our society just as much as any one person. And we need equal representation. And how do we accomplish that? Why don't we, do you want to open it up to? Yeah, we can chat about yeah, some of those things yeah. while we, Why don't we open, open it, up it up to Eli and uh, Yeah, no, that's, it's really great just to hear, kind of start the conversation um, to engage the audience. And we have some great folks um, on. I know Howard is on and we have several, you know, many others, Abby and whole several folks that are really uh, engaged in this area, particularly on media and marketing. So I think we want to encourage everyone to share comments and questions and um, but I think, you know, Bob and I will really start to engage um, and follow up on some of the things that you've had to say and to kind of dig deeper, if you will. Um, and I think that the one area that really strikes me about many of the things you're saying about sort of the luck component and also kind of how do we engage key stakeholders, you know, to kind of get them to have that aha moment or that tipping point. Um, 
I think part of it for me is how do we get, it seems like there is a little bit of a status quo of kind of this notion of disability as pity or the, the, the you know, the status, the, kind of the media and marketing seems to revert to this kind of one frame of uh, disability. And um, it seems like it's really hard to get beyond that. I know, Jeremy, you, we were able to talk to you a little bit about kind of the system and kind of how sometimes we get stuck in this. Um, but I guess if part of the innovations you've done and every all your projects, it seems like you're sort of challenging that and trying to get beyond that. But um, yeah, I just hope I might, you know, kind of seems like with ADA generation is that one day we'll get to a place where we kind of don't revert back to that. Um, and so I was hoping maybe you could speak to that a little bit in terms of like, how do we kind of continue to move beyond? I mean, obviously valuing disability, valuing uh, in this notion of inspiration in sport is a key part of it. But how do we kind of get beyond like the pity factor and the and the kind of where we are with this the stigma the the kind of the inspiration porn if you will, um, you know have you found kind of key ways or or kind of strategies you might suggest maybe yeah, to speak to about speak about that a little bit I guess yeah, yeah no it's a it's a great question and and something to kind of segue off of what you were just talking about of how do we utilize sport as that common language. You know, when we're sitting down with the corporate executives or agency partners and marketers, they all are, are invested in sport in some level. They're there, they're invested in sport, they have a passion for sport. How do we use that passion and show them that this movement is no different? And a lot of it comes down to the creative approach, as Mallory was saying, it's kind of this person first. And we've had the great fortune to now work with some of some amazing directors and writers and DPs and editors and educate them first in their approach that this is no different than that all access behind the scenes show that they've done on Notre Dame football for Showtime or for NBC or for CBS, whatever it looks like, it's the same. We're telling the same story. We just, there's just a different aspect of the story. These are all incredible athletes. And I think when we looked at empty net, that was our approach. We really wanted to focus on what was amazing is we actually shot the sequences of the biggest event of all time, it's Paralympic Games. And the latest miracle on ice was empty net. And the comeback, you know, with Declan Farmer, that whole thing, I mean, the camera operators we had there, they had the hardest job because they had to keep the camera still on that goal when Team USA won and keep on hold on that shot so it's not moving around. <laughs> and taking those individuals for three weeks that they had never been, ex most of them had never been exposed to the Paralympics or adaptive sports or anything. And after three weeks, they're hooked. And they shot it the same way that they would shoot anything else. And how we edited it, same thing. And it's that mentality that this is no different. And when you show that high production quality and that storytelling, and you sit down with the corporate executives, that shifts the mindset because to your point, a lot of them are used to maybe seeing a story told in more of that inspiring and it comes out of the music, right? The soft piano music and kind of those tendencies. And so your mind starts thinking differently when you watch something like that versus something like an empty net or some of the other commercial spots we've done. So it's all kind of how we package it together. You sit down with those teams, they have their own aha moments. So the exposure piece, the ability to see it in person. Yeah, correct. Yeah, and I, I think one of the things too that Eli, what you're hitting on, which I think is so important, and we've seen it, and it's been something that we've even battled of people look at their need to be involved or have a disability strategy as the kind of not only feel good, but their their nonprofit philanthropic approach to their business versus bringing disability in to the marketing strategy on their for-profit side of business. And so also when we work with brands, educating them to understand that the disability community is also their consumer. And if you want to bring your consumer in, you need to represent all of your consumer base. And so through that, and obviously our bread and butter is sport. I mean, that is how what we found is our, our common denominator, if you will. It's a language that we can kind of bring in and it transcends the field of play and it really helps bind in. But I think so many of us can agree that sport does such a powerful job of 
flipping the narrative of disability. I mean, for me personally, when I was paralyzed, I assumed all these things I would never do. And not only did I assume them, society was right there to tell me, here's all the things you'll never do. And when I was first exposed that night to the Paralympic movement, as I watched trials, I remember leaning over a railing with like my mouth wide open in just complete and utter awe as I realized that like every notion that I had built up over those first two months of my paralysis was so completely wrong. Like you're not physically incapable just because you happen to have a physical disability. And so I think there's that notion of like utilizing, I mean, goodness, wheelchair rugby, talk about a way to show like, you're not broken. I mean, you're charging after your teammates and competitors in your chair. And just capturing that imagery, I think, is, um, is really powerful to what Jay was saying and something we've used a lot as our strategy and our pitches. I guess just to, we're getting a question from Howard already, but I guess just a, a quick question I wanted to um, follow up on. Um, it just seems, one of the things that seems like a really great opportunity, and I know Jeremy and Mallory, you both are sort of touching on it, in terms of just the, the burst in media and the different types of outlets, the live, you know, the streaming you can do, all of these, you know, Disney and ESPN, and you know, everyone's having these kind of open. So it seems like the notion of content, you know, they're looking. I know Jeremy, in our conversations you, in Mallory, you've spoken a lot about content, mm -hmm. content drives, um, and with federations, with you know, different committees, and as we look to kind of be creating more inclusive awareness of sport, it seems like these. So much is happening with media. And um, so maybe if you could just talk about that briefly in terms of are there strategies around, you know, if they're looking for content, you know, it's, is this a way to get them, you know, another hook, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe if you could just talk about that and then we have some turning sure. to Bob and also about Howard. Yeah. Yeah, and I can I can touch on that. And and most certainly we're in those active conversations now with the buyers. Um, and trying to really shift that, that thinking that this content is not just focused for the disability community, right? It's like we talked about, we're, we're starting with sports and story together. It's a sports story, right? Whatever that looks like. And so whether it's a feature length documentary or it's a docu-series, um, just, just shifting that. Because I think a lot of the buyers and the executives, they, they see it and they go, oh, that's nice or that's inspirational, but is my viewer really going to, are they going to watch that? Are they going to consume it? Right? They're all for profit. They're looking for all these streaming services are looking for new subscriptions. So will this series or will this documentary help drive viewers? And the answer is yes, but we have to show why show and we have to not just tell, but show. Um, and so Mallory and I pre COVID had spent a lot of time with, you know, a lot of different uh, executives on the buying side and, and production studios and influencers and sitting in those meetings. And it's amazing to see the shift in just an hour of their mindset and how they come out of that going, we need this, of course we need it, we have to. And so it's kind of galvanizing a community to say, here's what we can do, and then giving them different ideas. And I think that's the biggest thing we've learned is not just be stuck to one idea and say, hey, this is our idea, and just stay to it. It's like, that's one of many mm -hmm. in different forms of what does that take? So. If, if a network says, you know what, yes, we're interested in that topic, but we may be only interested in a one-off pilot episode. That's fine. It's something, you know, you know, and kind of build off of that and just start kind of looking at all the different outlets and how we can have our impact. And that's Is there enough content? Becomes, like, yeah, part of it's, yeah. where's the content coming from? Yeah. yeah, and it becomes such a strong proof point in the, in the, um, the fact of, you, we kind of go in assuming who we're talking to has no exposure to disability. And in that, we educate in a way that hopefully gives us the opportunity to completely change the narrative around maybe how they would have been exposed if it weren't for you and I sitting down in a meeting. And I think where the content aspect is such a powerful point is what Jay was saying is the show don't tell. And you can't assume every individual knows somebody within the disability community has been to a adaptive sporting event or whatever it might be. And so how you utilize that content in the, in the aspect of show don't tell to help change that perception 
is where we take the ownership in how we storytell because we know every piece of content that goes out in 2020 lives online in some capacity and can always be rewatched. And that could be rewatched by somebody who lives with a disability themselves and is just trying to figure out where their path forward is and is gathering more information. It could be viewed by somebody who is a marketer and runs a marketing budget and is looking for strategies internally at their own corporation. It could be viewed by a buyer at a network. And so how do you constantly make sure you're creating, I would say it's like a brand identity of sorts around that conversation. So the content, while it's all different stories, there is a seamless approach to help kind of utilize that storytelling effort in a way that slowly but surely starts to kind of change that narrative and perception. Excellent. I guess, um, Bob, I think we'll go and turn to Howard's and then follow up with some question. So uh, Howard's asking a great question to Mallory. Um, can you speak to what you think the swim community from grassroots to the elite level has done well to bring people with disabilities to the sport and what they could do better. Also what you've both seen in sports across the board are best practices and good models. Really excellent question, so. Yeah, no, Howard, that's a great question. I think one of the things that we've seen change a lot over the years in the sport of swimming in particular has been the involvement of athletes with disabilities in mainstream competitions. Um, and so for USA Swimming and within, I don't know how familiar you are with the structure of swimming, but within USA Swimming, you have all the local swimming communities as we call them. So Minnesota is an LLC, LSC and you have them kind of for each state roughly. Some are regional based on the size of the area. Um, so it really years ago started kind of at that, I would say grassroots level in the local swimming communities. So. I know for me personally, after my injury, I swam in pretty much every single mainstream meet in Minnesota that I could swim in because A, I just loved to race, but B, it was a way to showcase adaptive sports in the kind of mainstream forum. And so we really have done a lot of that in the swimming community. And now you see a number of our athletes who are competing as a part of NCAA collegiate teams. I myself had an opportunity early after my injury to compete as a D1 swimmer for a semester before I transferred out. And, you know, I think that is a huge shift we've seen, which what that creates is not every athlete becomes an Olympian. Therefore, not every adaptive athlete is going to become a Paralympian. But right now, at least when I was in high school growing up before my injury, I knew I was never going to be an Olympian. But if I wanted to compete in college, there was a path forward for me beyond high school. And so for so long in so many sports within the adaptive sports community, swimming being one of them, there was no path forward. It was like you swim at a regional meet for para swimming, then you maybe go to Can-Am championships, which were our nationals. And that's about it. And so now that we've mainstreamed the sport more and more, and there's granted still a long ways to go, but it's allowed swimmers to get involved in a way where they may never want to go that far. They maybe just want to swim on their high school swim team and maybe look at options to have a collegiate experience. Um, and so I would say that we've done a really good job with that because I know that has been an effort that U.S. Paralympic Swimming has been involved in helping guide collegiate programs and local swimming programs. Um, and that's a big thing that's changed in the past 12 years that I've been involved in the sport. And I would say on that aspect, I think one of the models that I'm always fascinated by is like what wheelchair basketball has done with some of their collegiate programs. And the fact that you have athletes who are going to schools on scholarships as a part of the wheelchair basketball teams. And I think if we could find a way to use that model, and I don't honestly know enough about it because wheelchair basketball is so foreign <laughs> to me as a swimmer, but there's a lot of things that you're seeing. And I think that really helps build that grassroots effort because it gives athletes coming into sports, just like a able body athlete, if you will, I hate that terminology, which is why I always do the air quotes because I don't know what else to say. Um, it gives them a, a path forward through sports okay, and yeah. not having to 
always, not everyone's going to be a Paralympian, not everyone's an Olympian and that's okay, but it doesn't mean that sport shouldn't still be an accessible aspect of their life. So I don't know, Jeremy, do you, if you want to add to it yeah, at all, I, just overall sport, Federa yeah, or the Mallory, right. just kind of broader also in terms of how these sure. sport federations are engaging and yeah, no, and you talk about that. I think USA Hockey's done an incredible job. Obviously, you yeah. got to know them well through M2 Net, but following them and what they've done in terms of creating content. And for them, they kind of embed a, a videographer with the team on pre COVID on any of the trips. They would be, uh, you know, filming interviews and content, editing that and getting that out. It's no different than you see that an NFL team pushing content out on their social channels. So for us, you know, content like that is amazing. There's a user generated content, but it's produced in a way that kind of brings fans behind the scenes a bit into what's going on. And so, you know, a fan could join and understand what is the sport of sled hockey, get to know the players, you know, they're at these tournaments, follow along. And then, oh, by the way, now these games are being broadcast on NBCSN or the Olympic channel. And so you're creating that following and bringing fans in, you know, through this funnel um, and then they can go follow along. So I think it's important that, you know, athletes are taking more ownership on social and creating their own content. Federations are really kind of putting budgets aside and doing that as well. And I think USA Hockey has done a good yeah. job. Um, and I think others, you know, are starting to follow along on that. Yeah. I think the team sport and the individual sport kind of having, looking at how they're evolving. Yeah, I think swimming is, you know, been the evolution of Paralympic swimming and USA swimming and, and how different NGBs are looking at that in a different ways, you know, tennis and volleyball and, you know, kind of, but I think connecting it to the media component. And I think what you, like you said, how hockey yeah. kind of put a kind of pioneer that in so many ways to kind of see what's, what's possible. Yeah. Um, I guess I'll turn it over to Bob. Maybe Bob, do you want to maybe, that conversation around innovation or, or kind of where we went ahead and then we'll just so we could we we're thinking we could talk to you all for about three hours or more <laughs> we always have things but I'll, I'll turn it over to Bob now yeah just block a half kind of half your day <laughs> off um yeah well there's many things to start on the first thing that just came to mind and uh, just a series of couple of questions but the first one is uh with with uh empty net how many I guess knows that that it did you have to endure I guess and, and do you know when the aha moment was where they like wow this is right on this is what we need to do and did it take very long i'm sorry for the rapid questions but <laughs> no that's... yeah sure going in um as mallory mentioned we were going in not thinking we we're going to film a sled hockey documentary uh we were going in to kind of film the kind of gravitas of the paralympic movement and the games and uh getting to that point was about a year-long process of figuring out how are we going to find the funding who are the right partners, our access, all those things. So there was a lot of doors shut in our face, opened, pivoting, and uh, getting a crew there because we can't recreate the games. You can't just sit there and go, okay, we'll do it next year. Or we'll do it down the road. If we're going to do it. We have to figure out a way to do it. And so while we were there, the story of the sled hockey team started to evolve. So our attention and you know, and, and from, a, from a producer perspective, I kind of started shifting our attention towards hockey and making sure our crews were there, we're getting the sound bites, we're getting all the coverage. And then following, Mallory and I had a meeting uh, with a dear friend, uh, Lena Glazer over at NBC. Um, and she was in charge, she was a producer of the Paralympics for NBC. Mm. And following, she said, do you have good coverage of sled hockey? I said, yes. And we started going and kind of brainstorming. We were sitting in our office mm -hmm. and we threw out the idea of what about an hour long feature on the sled hockey team? And she was like, I love it. And we said, well, let's figure out the right time. And she said, well, Stanley cup finals are coming up, you know, first week of June. And this was this the was end of April that we're having this April? conversation. And we knew in our head, like, <laughs> well, we still have to do interviews with the athletes who are the key athletes that are going to be part of the story. And we quickly we had no budget, no budget. So we were trying to figure out how do we take the footage we got in Pyeongchang, somehow build a budget around it, get pickup interviews and filming, and then edit a documentary in six weeks. Oh, less than that. Yeah, it was like time about, we got yeah, five weeks. Yeah. Have it on air <laughs> and working with NBC and then starting to work and get uh, Toyota involved. 
And Toyota ended up getting involved later on. We did a re-air around Thanksgiving in 2018. Um, but pulling all the pieces together, and that's how we had to kind of always pivot, figure out, okay, how do yeah. we get this on air? And it was absolutely incredible. I remember delivering it the day before, you know, you're sitting, make sure the follow-up loads, and then watching it for the first time. You know, I was on the edge of my seat going, okay, go to commercial break, go to commercial break. Okay, we went to commercial break. And then coming out of commercial break, and there was no hiccups or anything. And to see the momentum from that point, and what we've learned and what was fun about that, that was just the starting point for empty net, you know, yeah. then we started to build and we got Toyota involved and we had multiple airings on NBCSN, the Olympic channel, then Amazon prime picked it up. And now we've had screenings as well with adaptive organizations, um, sharing the story with, with athletes and families and exposing them. And I think a, a personal story that's near and dear to our hearts, mm -hmm. uh, a neighbor of my parents in Massachusetts watched the film on NBC when it first aired, uh, newly, newly injured, uh, was it above the knee amputee or below the knee amputee, yeah. uh, newly injured and avid sports fanatic pre-injury wasn't exposed to the adaptive, the adaptive world, didn't really understand it. And she is now hooked. She's competing. She's on a sled hockey team. She's got synthetic ice in her basement and seeing that that was her moment. And for us, that's another driving force to say we got to do more we have to do more yeah, yeah. very good uh, we do have some more questions uh you know if you want to yeah. do that one i have another one but go ahead and let's go here from abby okay yeah that's no, good i think we can kind of go back and forth and kind of keep this informal um but yeah really good abby um finds in terms of her work you know teaching and bringing the video into the classroom and, and getting people engaged and so this is a question about impact as currency, kind of how do we engage, you know, help increase consumption. Um, I can show my students videos and guide discussion, but how can we make it more natural on the non-production side? So, mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of been having that conversation and, and really opening it up to you got you all are the pioneers and expert experts in this area. So, we'll, and it's great that Abby brought this question to the, to the forefront. Yeah, Abby, that's a great question. And, you know, I, I, I would kind of piggy off to what Jay just finished in saying of the exposure is such an important piece of this right now, right? There's still, we're getting more and more content out there by the day it feels, but there is, there's still a need for, for that exposure for so many individuals like Rebecca. Mm -hmm. And it's really powerful to see that. And I think when we look at impact as currency, that right there to us is a success story. And so I think some of that came in for us early on and when we were building just kind of out like the business model of our company and knowing, you know, how do we, how do we deem success stories as a business? And so not always looking at it as a financial success, but also an impact success, if you will, like Rebecca. And I think for you, you know, that question of, increasing consumption and I love your example of showing your students and I, I think that's huge and and guiding discussions that allow it to just like Eli keeps saying you know this is kind of an informal conversation of just ask questions and let's just talk because I think so often in disability we're afraid to talk about it because we don't want to say the wrong thing and then we don't talk about it and then it doesn't do anything to move the needle and so I think there's an element of we need content out there so people can see it. And then that content needs to create intrigue and yeah, maybe some curiosity. So somebody asks the question of like, well, that's really cool. I'm trying to understand like, wow, how, so how does that work? And then guess what? Now there's enough content. You can go out and find something else and, and look that up and you can maybe see an example of it. But I do think that those conversations and discussions following allowing them to be as open as possible while still being respectful conversations um, is part of the importance of the other side of this coin. It's not just about having content out there. It's about getting that content into people's hands so they can see it and digest it in a way that now sparks a conversation around it because I mean, anybody who lives in the disability community knows that we are all met with this notion of like, don't stare. Well, 
okay? We're told not to stare because it's rude because something looks different. And that's a whole separate conversation, but it kind of goes into this idea that it's like, well, that if we never talk about it because it's uncomfortable, then we never change it. And so that's where I love this idea of bringing things into the classroom, mm -hmm. goodness gracious, and let them ask questions and, and figure that out and let that intrigue kind of be sparked. And so that's where we view mm -hmm. impact as currency in these kind of mm -hmm. success stories, if you will. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, I, I just also wanted to follow up in regards to a little bit of thinking about innovation. Uh, considering our, our current, um, uh, our, our new normal, I guess, with, with COVID, uh, Jeremy, Valerie, do, do you feel uh, there's going to be some challenges production-wise as far as how you're going to uh, bridge that gap, if you will? Um, sure. You know, what are some of the conversations maybe you're having now or, or hope to have that would help in, in continuing this great work that you're doing, uh, considering we're in the midst of, of, of the pandemic? Sure. No, it certainly is a challenge. Um, you know, the first few months with everything on lockdown and quarantine, it was no, no travel, nobody's out and about, and we're constantly trying to figure out, okay, how do we, how do we get our content out there? Fortunately, we had our, our latest film, Fresh Tracks, that had been finished and in film festivals. So it was a quick pivot to virtual film festivals and then getting the distribution. So that's, you know, our, our latest film. Now it's figuring out, working with brands to say, okay, we can still film uh, very safely and I'm not getting on a plane. I'm sitting behind my computer doing interviews uh, remotely like we're doing now. Um, but finding those creatives uh, around the country and reaching out to them blindly. There's a few we've already you know, been introduced and I haven't met them in person, but we've had them you know, out on a location because we're not traveling there and we just have you know, a jack of all trades who's the videographer, the editor and sound guy and going in and, and getting some incredible content. So really adapting to the environment right now and figuring out, okay, we're not going to stop, but how can we continue to create it? And one of the things we did personally on our end with, with Mallory is we created a, a social series called uh, Spark a Conversation, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Instagram lives that Mallory took part in. I think we did 13 episodes. 13. Oh, wow. Season one, as we're calling it, um, <laughs> it took a, it took a little break. Uh, it's going to start up again after the new year. Yeah. They were weekly, and so we yeah. we did yeah thirteen before we took a break on them. But it was our way to kind of control a little bit of the conversation and, and and distribution because we could do it from the confines of our home and somebody else's home. And so I think now, as we look ahead, we're starting to figure out what can we still do. We have a new documentary that's in production and it's all around kind of the healing powers of nature and outdoors so we can do things safely outside. Um, but as we look ahead the next few months, it's gonna get hard again, but what can we do? Let's not stop. And it's constantly to your point, Bob, of, of you know, innovating, getting creative. And you know, we're now nine months into this and you know, brands have gotten really creative in accepting the new virtual world. And, you know, the production side, the distributor side, but I think the biggest thing is constantly making sure story first and making sure our production quality is on par with kind of the brand and what we're trying to put out there. Yeah. Awesome. We have about, you know, 10 more minutes or so. You know, Ted and Sean and uh, several of the others that are on, you know, Howard again and others just to continue to engage. Um, I guess one of the questions that I, since we have you all, this is a great opportunity to to have you, you know, document your thoughts right now. And part of the question is about the future. So if we were to look to, you know, 10 to 15 years from now, and you've seen a lot of progress over the last, you know, three to five, and even, you know, you know, since 2011, really, you know, that kind of growth in the last seven to nine years, really. Um, but if you were to project out, you know, 10 to 15 years from now, and particularly on the media marketing side, in terms of like what you might see as like some things we just haven't thought about or seen before or or things you'd like to see um kind of a big question but you know how answer however you'd like you know even as a couple ideas or a couple of thoughts on like where you yeah. see the media marketing space and no, intended no 15. i don't have a smirk i'm just you you start yeah, i'm it. sure you've got thoughts on this one he has a smirk no. he's like yeah no. i've got a few thoughts yeah, um <laughs> but obviously maybe some like things you don't want to share right now but no no, no. eli i think that's a great question and i think that that's 
that's the area that we love to exist in as well. We like to be solution oriented and, you know, it's a, a conversation around innovation and pivoting and kind of just like really being creative in the moment. There's also something really fun about looking at that long-term roadmap and dreaming and dreaming up possibilities. Um, I really do think that in the disability community at large, even outside of the Paralympic movement, which obviously sport is kind of our niche, but I would say the level of representation that not only do I hope we will see, but I, I truly do believe we are going to see in the next decade in our society in so many ways. And I, I really, the optimist in me hopes I'm, I'm right on this one. I think it's going to happen in a way that even right now in this conversation, we probably can't even predict. I truly do believe that the Paralympic Games coming to the U.S. in 2028 is going to completely change our landscape. And the beauty of that is we know it's coming. And so we can start planning. We can start building out proof points. We can start laying down concepts and all these things so that when it does come, that foundation has been built in a way where we can maximize the momentum that it creates and carry it forward. And I really do think that's going to be an opportunity not just for the sports community, but for our community and society as an entirety. I mean, you can look at what happened in the UK after the London 2012 Games and just see that change, the change in employment in society, the change in representation in all facets of society. And I think that that is going to be something I, I truly hope to see. And, you know, the, the dreamer in me, I think it's possible. And, you know, I came back from, I had the opportunity to go to the Golden Globes this year, pre-COVID, back when those were things that we did going to events. Awesome. And one of the things that really struck me was while I was there, I did not see, and granted, I understand not all disabilities are visible, but I did not see a single person as I navigated through the entire day where we spent, what, three hours on that red carpet moving around hmm. and we went to all the events afterwards and it's see That's anybody. Interesting. But the one thing I did see is the Netflix post party was fully accessible. It was the only place I went that somebody didn't have to carry my wheelchair and myself upstairs. I couldn't even get through and finish the red carpet at the Golden Globes without being met by three stairs at the end. And everybody looked at me and we looked at the stairs and they're like, we didn't plan for that mm -hmm. because they're not used to seeing a wheelchair on that red carpet. And when we went to the Netflix party, it was completely accessible. And we assumed at first when we looked at the staircase, it wasn't because nothing else was. Mm -hmm. And the group I was with was getting ready to figure out the gentlemen were going to all kind of carry me down. And a guy came up to us and said, oh, no, no, ma'am, over this way, we have a, we have a lift. And I, went, I sought him out afterwards and I thanked him. Mm. And he said, in the, in the planning of this party, we wanted to make sure that anybody who came through these doors could enjoy the experience. Mm. And for me, it was like there was that element, a little bit of kind of frustration earlier in the day. But then when that happened, it was like, but we're getting there. Yeah. Like it's there. We're, we're scratching the surface and it, it's mm. happening. And if we focus on that and highlight that, it's only going to keep compounding on itself. And so it I think it's like going entertainment to be more people. seems like entertainment and fashion are making yeah. some. You know. And that's going to, I do think that that's going to change because those are the places that we see representation. Our magazines, our TVs, our all of those kind of media platforms. That's, that's where we see things. And it, it's really hard to become what you can't see. Yeah. And we need to see more. And I think we will. I, I really do. Yeah. I mean, I'm and a That's a great player. point about how does sport catch up to this? Yeah. Yeah. No, so, I, think, I think just kind of normalize it. So when we're watching TV and watching some of these commercials, it becomes normal to see and we're start, we're getting there. I mean, last night we were watching uh, a, a show. Microsoft. Yeah, Microsoft came on and, and it was two individuals signing back and forth. And we both stopped and we're like, did you, did you just see that? Did you just see that? You know, we're starting to see, but get to a point where we're not stopping ourselves saying, hey, did you see the individual in the, in the chair or the amputee or, you know, the individual signing? It's becoming normal that it's an everyday occurrence. So the more we can show that, then it becomes ingrained in our society that it's not, they're, they're used to seeing it. That's how commercials are. And they're evoking that emotion. So kind of normalizing that and then flooding our content. 
and between the, the streamers that are out there that are starting up and, and pushing content out there, mm-hmm. that it's not, you know, one documentary a year on Netflix. I mean, we've got, I think, seven shows this year that were announced on the University of ADA, which were great. Let's move seven to 20. Let's yeah. do 20 to 40, you know, quickly on a yearly mm-hmm. basis. Let's not wait and uh, leverage the LA games coming um, here now, you know, seven years and let's push hard. And in scripted, let's yeah. see roles of people with disabilities played by people with disabilities. Like yes. we not only need to see it happen, we need it to be authentic to the community. There mm. is a massive talent pool in the disability community. We are not short on talent. We have so much untapped potential in our community and garnering that and bringing that in and bringing it to the forefront. I mean, you have Ali Stroker who just won a Tony and exactly. mind you, she won a Tony and then she couldn't get on stage to accept her Tony, but she won a Tony. Okay. Like we're getting progress. And so I think there's, there's aspects like that where then this conversation of that questioning like kind of comes out of sport. And yes. in my opinion, I think sport is what allows that to happen. I think LA 2028, is going to change the landscape and normalize it in a way like Jay's saying that we also realize the human potential of people within the disability community and it opens the door to opportunities wide and large across the spectrum. Excellent. Well, good. Well, thank you for just, it's great to have you, you know, kind of yeah. share those comments and those reflections. We have a couple more minutes and I do have a, kind of one last one. It's more of a personal kind of a reflection question and your leadership roles um, as we're wrapping up. I know there'll be several folks that will probably want to, you know, follow up and engage and maybe, you know, share, if you're willing to share your contact info and all that, we can do that. Um, But yeah, I think it's always just, you know, interesting to hear, um, you know, what, what um, kind of engages you, like whether it's a book or a movie or, or just a practice that you have each day um, to kind of keep you engaged. And so I thought perhaps you could share kind of that, like is there, a, like to this audience here and to us from a kind of, you know, what, what are those books or those movies or what's that practice that you have on a daily basis? Um, I know Jeremy the other day spoke to me about kind of his three, his three principles and things like that. Um, but perhaps you could just share briefly as we wrap up in the next couple of minutes. Yeah. You want to go first? <laughs> you always do this. He's such a little... I'm not going to finish that sentence. He's my husband. I love him. I don't know if any of you work with your spouse, but I highly recommend it. You might um, end up in separate rooms by the end of the <laughs> No, I love it. We don't get sick of each other yeah, usually. No, no, no. Um, <laughs> so, Eli, I think that's a great question. And one of the things that it kind of sparked for me as you were talking is this notion of knowing your why. And so while it's not a movie or a book, it's, it's more of a practice. Um, so for me, I, and honestly, this is how Jay and I fell in love. I mean, he, he started the story of saying we, we were exposed to each other. He more so to me at the 2011 ESPYs because he was sitting in front of my mom and dad. Um, and we kind of met by chance and we started working together. He became my agent. And through that, we had a lot of conversations about what did I want for a career? I was at the beginning of it. I hadn't gone to a games yet, but what I, what did I envision for my career and my legacy as an athlete in on the field of play and off? And I think it really stemmed down to this, this concept of your why. And as a kid, my dad really always encouraged us to know it. And anyone who meets my dad in a, in a professional setting, especially He'll ask you, what's your why? Like, that's part of what he just wants to know with anyone he's surrounding himself with. And a lot of that rubbed off on me. And when we met and started having those conversations, we realized that was one of the things that was fundamental Mm. to the both of us. And that concept that knowing your why in terms of what it is that you're doing, who you are as a person is what guides you, not just personally, but professionally, because To us, we don't see it as two different things. I'm not different in a professional setting than I am a personal setting. I'm I'm just as dorky right here as I'll be when we get off camera. Um, And that's just who I am. And I think there's a lot of truth to just being authentic in that and all that you do. And so for me, that daily practice would be honoring, 
honoring my why and <clears throat> through the moments, whether they're the highs or the lows, kind of doing my part to make decisions each day, whether it's in a day like today where admittedly I woke up super overwhelmed and taking a minute to turn some music on while I get ready and just slow down to remind myself, what is it that I'm trying to accomplish today? Here are the things I'm grateful for in this moment. And this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. And I think that's a big thing for us. And, and I think as I keep talking about my why, for me, it stems back to a phrase my dad told my sisters and I every single night. Um, and growing up, it was just part of the daily routine. And he would tell us, you're the best. You can make a difference and you can change the world. And yes. I'm not saying that I'm going to go be the next, you know, whoever mm -hmm. it is with the profound legacy. But I do, I do believe wholeheartedly that every single one of us mm -hmm. has the power to do those three things. If we simply get up every day in a way that honors our truth and we give our best in whatever it is that we're doing. If we do those two things, we will compound those into making a difference and changing the world in some capacity through our craft and our community. And so I think for me, that's, that's really what it's about, what it's about when I go to the pool and when we sit down at our dinner table as a husband and wife and plan out our personal life and when we plan for our next project, it's honoring that. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing. Yeah, it's hard to follow, Jeremy. Yeah, it's hard to follow <laughs> that segue, uh, but it's continuing, you know, that's our mission and our why, you know, and I get up every day and fill out a gratitude journal and very grateful that individuals put their trust in us to share their most vulnerable stories with the world. And we carry that with us. And we've had the great fortune to, to meet some incredible individuals. And, you know, one um, is no longer with us. Her name is Grace Bunky. And, you know, we had the honor to share her story with the world, a young 14 year old uh, who uh, succumbed to osteosarcoma. And her story, I think, is, is for me, and I know we've shared, is our driving force. And how can we continue to share more and share these stories out with the world? Mm -hmm. And they need to be told. And people are putting great trust in us. And we have a lot of responsibility uh, to go out there in the right way to tell the stories. And that's how, I mean, I'm beyond grateful for that every single day. And that's my charge. You know, and that's our charge of how I remember sitting, I forget what year it was, I think it was 2013, you know, we're talking about Mallory's quote, and she, you know, I had this, I don't know, how, how can I change the world? You know, I'm a swimmer, I'm doing this. And I just said, there, we having one of those down days. Those down days, I said, we're going to do it. And we're going to figure out our way to do it together. And um, yes. we're, do we're just getting started, I would say. And um, and we talked about being, this is a lifestyle business as we welcome kids into our family. And as we go on, this is what we're going to be doing for a very, very long time. Nice. Well, no, it's great to have you both on these, you know, leadership chats and you know, it's, everything you're doing is amazing and groundbreaking and really paving a path. So well, thanks for joining us. Yeah, Bob and I, we just, and all of our other partners, you know, really appreciative. We're, we're going to, uh, Bob, do you want to say any final words and we can kind of wrap up? Sure. Just again, I want to thank Jeremy and Mallory. Uh, great, great advice, great tips, great leadership, and uh, definitely look forward to uh, seeing more of your work. And and I'm going to send you guys an email because I have a little bit of uh, and came up with a prototype uh, to move forward mm -hmm. down the road. But uh, thank you for joining us, and thank you for all the people that have uh, attended as well. And uh, this this uh, conversation will be uh, linked at the NICPAD website, and we'll get that information out. Thank you. Perfect. Excellent. Well, thank Thanks, you. everyone. I'm gonna and I'm gonna stop uh, recording.